Good morning, church. Thank you for joining us this week as we continue our teaching in the book of Acts. The actions of the apostles by the Holy Spirit is what we have called this series. And I want to publicly thank one of our elders, one of the members of our teaching team, Daniel Delwood, for his message last week towards the end of Acts chapter 12. Today we're going to conclude chapter 12, one verse, and then begin in chapter 13 as Sarah read through verse 12. Now, we've been stressing the fact each week that how we come to the scriptures matter. And what we just read, where we are in the book of Acts, is going to point out the reality of how important it is that we come to the scriptures, how necessary it is to know the Jesus of the word rather than just one we've made up in our minds. Today, we'll see the byproduct of how we really, or uh, how important it is to come to the word of God with respect and reverence. And for those of us who maybe are yet to become believers, to actually commit to Jesus, we want to make sure that you hear what we teach from an orthodoxy of an interpretation of the scripture that's consistent. Because today we will see what happens when the gospel message is perverted, perverse, or left out, perhaps not understood, and possibly ignored. Now, most of us, if you've been here, especially as we've gone through the series, we are very familiar with the testify verse. At the beginning of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says to his disciples, and I'm going to ask for some participation, but you will receive power, power, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What does a witness do? There we go. All right. So far in the book of Acts, we have studied the message of the gospel going out to those in Jerusalem until Stephen was martyred, and then the message began to spread throughout Judea and Samaria, where Gentiles, along with Jews, were hearing the gospel message and being invited into relationship with God through Jesus' finished work. Today, we will see the third step of the Holy Spirit's strategy to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth beyond Judea and Samaria. God's plan was never for this message of redemption to stay only in one place, but his continued plan for this message is to be proclaimed where it has not been heard before, from our own households, to our neighbors, to our workplaces, to the schools that we attend, far off lands, other countries, and unreached people groups. So let's dive into the end of chapter 12, where Luke points out the movement of some of God's people. And just so you know, there's going to be some teaching, and then towards the end of the passage, I'm going to start preaching for real, and I'll let you judge when that happens. When Barnabas, verse 25, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Luke points out that Saul, a.k.a. Paul, and Barnabas had finished their visit to Jerusalem. Towards the end of chapter 11, as we've been studying this letter, Luke speaks about a prophet named Agabus, who had come to Antioch and predicted there would be a great famine, and the church in Antioch gathered gifts that they would give to the elders in Jerusalem via way of Barnabas and Saul. But I also want to bring attention to who they took with him. John, also known as John Mark, aka uh, Mark, who writes the eventual uh, uh, letter as a disciple of Peter named Mark. Mark was also Barnabas's cousin. And Mark helps stir some drama in leadership later on in the book of Acts, but we'll get there eventually. Verse 1 of chapter 13. Now in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had brought up, who was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Luke is pointing out that some of the gift mix within the church in Antioch it was very diverse. God had provided some prophets, those who were prophetic, and by prophetic, we don't only mean those who could and would tell the future, but the more consistent use of the gift in the New Testament, which was to speak the truth of God in a manner that others could understand and could obey. Now, I want to share some of what commentators for years have speculated about, specifically in this passage, regarding some who of of these people, uh, as Luke was documenting them, who and what gift set they might have had. Barnabas, who we have met before, was this great encourager. He was back in Antioch, and according to this text, was gifted in prophecy. Prophecy. 
Simeon, called Niger, who was a man from Nigeria, who also was probably a prophet of the Lord's, sharing the truth of God, and people had their minds open to the reality of the gospel. And their lives were changed by the faith that was being exercised. Also, there was Lucius of Cyrene, another man from North Africa, who most commentators believe was also a prophet of the Lord's. There was Menaean, who according to some extra-biblical resources, was the foster brother to Herod. Now, we spoke a lot about Herod in the past two weeks. Which Herod? It was the Herod that Jesus stood before prior to his crucifixion. And there was Saul, who became Paul, and for the most part, from now on, we're going to call him Paul, no longer Saul, who we know as a former persecutor of the church and eventually an apostle of the Lord's. But here, he is spoken about, we're kind of guessing here, as a teacher, more so than an apostle which leads some to speculate that Paul was still earning his wings as an apostle, which I don't know if I completely buy that, but Paul here seemed to be exercising the gift of his teaching ability from the scriptures, expounding on them with the gospel as the point. Now, I think one thing implied by Luke or that we can take away from this list of prophets and teachers is that they were very diverse in their upbringing, their nationalities, their skin color, and their spiritual backgrounds. Verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The Holy Spirit communicate, uh, communicates to they, which signifies the congregation who was not just sitting dormant, not just sitting around, but Luke says was worshiping and fasting, seeking the direction of God. Let me be clear, Christianity is not passive, it's not punitive, it is relational and progressive. Progressive, happening or developing gradually or in stages, proceeding step by step in your relationship with God. This is one of the things that happens because when you become a Christian and years later, you ought to be putting into practice his word and growing in your maturity and your understanding of grace. Christianity is not a faith where we just sit around and do nothing to strengthen one's faith or knowledge of the Son. It takes and even motivates action to want to grow and know our God more intimately and personally. So our relationship with God is, is also not punitive. It's not a, I scratch your back, God, and then you scratch mine and you give me what I want because I obeyed you or I attended church or I gave money. See, we don't earn or achieve, we receive God's grace and get to love him back because he first loved us. Now, we cannot expect things from God because of our effort or our deeds. We can only worship him because we first realize our need for him. And once we respond in faith, in repentance, we begin a lifestyle of, of worship, a lifestyle of dependence, a lifestyle of trust of a God that while we were at our worst, showed us grace, gave us faith, and we could respond in devotion to the one who deserves our praise. So while this congregation was worshiping the Lord and fasting, and it doesn't tell us what songs they were listening to, while this church was seeking God, God the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Now it does not say that he spoke to them through the prophets that were within their midst. It did not say that while they were studying the scriptures, the Spirit spoke to them. It just points out that while they were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke, which could have meant he used one of those previously mentioned vessels. But the point wasn't how God spoke. It was really more about who was speaking, which was God, the Holy Spirit. And what did he say? Set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to. Verse 3. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. So the congregation's in agreement with this calling by the Holy Spirit to set apart Barnabas and Saul and to be sent out to do the work led by the Holy Spirit. So the congregation lays hands as a symbol of unity in the work of God in these two specific individuals and sent them off through praying for them and over them. But it was the Holy Spirit who had been guiding and leading the apostles and believers ever since to do the unfinished work of continuing to proclaim the gospel all over the world to all different types of people. Verse 4. 
The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, I'm totally pronouncing those wrong, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Luke makes known that Barnabas and Saul went about 16 miles to the port city of Seleucia, and then from there they sailed to Cyprus, ending up at the port city of Salamis, and John, also known as John Mark, went with the two of them as an assistant. While they naturally went into the synagogues in order to proclaim the completion of the story of the Old Testament, the coming of the king, his life, his death, his resurrection that would complete what the Hebrew scriptures had foreshadowed and taught about. They were first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, so they first went into the synagogue. So hear me, I love the Old Testament. Not because I love rules and regulations, and not because I'm good at following rules and regulations. In fact, I really stink, if I'm honest, and if my wife was in here, she'd say amen, I really stink at following directions. Like, I'm really bad at it. Like, I'm awful at it. I so respect those of you who do not know how to do something. You watch a YouTube video, and then voila, you're an expert. That's not me. I tend to be worse at something after reading or hearing the directions. I'm not sure if it's my lack of attention span. Squirrel. I'm not sure if it's my internal sinfulness that doesn't want me to want to be told what to do. But remember that I love the Old Testament, because I don't read it as directions to live a better life or as guidelines in order to please God. But the Old Testament shows the need of mankind for a better Adam, for a better judge, for a better king, and all that tells the very intricate story of mankind's inability to save themselves. But there, and if we're honest, our lack of our, or our absolute need for a savior who could do what we could not do for ourselves, which was live a perfect life, die for sinners, die for sinners, and then rise physically from the dead. And so when I read the Old Testament, I'm looking for Jesus because he is there. And this is what Saul and Barnabas were doing in the synagogues, letting those who considered themselves devout were being taught who they really ought to be devout to which was God's only son, who lived the life none of us could, died the death that all of mankind deserves to die, and then physically rose from the grave, making a way for each of us, by faith, through God's grace, in Jesus Christ, to be in a forgiven relationship with God. Verse 6. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Now, I told some of you, when I saw you, when you walked in, I was like, ah, this text is harsh. And it's about to be. Saul and Barnabas and John Mark all traveled to Paphos, which was about 90 miles southwest of Salamis. There they met a, a sorcerer of Jewish descent named Bar Jesus. Bar Jesus translated simply to son of Jesus, which was another way of saying a follower of Jesus in the Hebrew culture, which sounds fine. To be a follower of Jesus is a great thing. It is what we pray that each of us would eventually become if we haven't already. The problem was that Bar Jesus, while saying that he was a follower of Jesus and even identifying him based on his name, did not teach or look anything like Jesus. He was the beginning of a very long line of what are known as Christian cultists who invoke the name of Jesus, but do not teach what Jesus taught. Do not share the message of the gospel of grace as of first importance and want you to follow them rather than follow Jesus, which honestly is more prevalent and spiritually devastating than most of us realize in all churches today. Now, I know that people disagree on many things. Like, we can be honest about this, right? Like, we disagree on things. And what this pandemic has truly amplified in my name, is, or in my mind, is that relationships, friendships, have to be based not on agreeing on absolutely everything, but to give grace when we disagree on secondary things that should not be where our identity is drawn from. But many, many, many of us find our identity in things that are not Jesus. Jesus. 
And as we have stated time and time before, that's a real problem if you claim to be a Christian. Yes, I'm a Christian, but no, I don't draw my identity from Jesus. I draw it from this team, or I draw it from my job. Because the reality is that most of us, even those who claim to be Christians, want to work for their salvation, or they think that they're not that bad, or they find contentment and fulfill, fulfillment in things that they can control themselves, rather than the sovereign Lord who loves us, and what he says goes. I bring up what he says goes because that requires an understanding of his word that goes beyond just a flippant once a week reading, but a hearing to be known by God and to know God. Bar Jesus teaching like all Christianized cults gives a little bit of truth, at least in the words that are used, but are defined significantly differently. And the emphasis is not on God's intervening grace, but on a work that is done in order to either justify oneself or to further the influence of the cult's beliefs. Now, I want to be real with you as a church. I try to be every single time I'm up here. I try to be that with everybody, and sometimes it gets me into trouble. This, what we're talking about right now, is my hot button. You won't hear me get up here and complain about the government from the pulpit until they attempt to distort the truth of the gospel. You won't hear me share my thoughts on different laws and or bills that should or shouldn't be passed from the pulpit. You won't hear me attempt to justify my opinions from the scriptures about current events. You won't hear me attempt to convince anyone that I have cracked the code and know when Jesus is coming back. Except I do have one quick hint. He's coming back sooner now than ever before. You're welcome. But when people distort the truth of the gospel... In the name of Jesus, my gears grind. I want to say F words like forgiven. <laughs> my blood boils. I get upset while knowing that it is a biblical thing to want to defend and content, contend for the gospel. Here's where I'm being real. I don't always act like Christ when I do this and I attempt to fight against cults pretending to preach the gospel. So what I don't want you to hear is me justifying myself and what could be called by some holy anger against such types of people who distort and perverse the message of grace. <sighs> but I also don't want any of us to think it's okay in any way to teach a message from the scriptures other than saved by grace through faith in Christ. Anything else is an interpretation that just does not hold up within the scriptures. Paul, speaking to the, the church in Galatia, makes a pretty strong statement about how this should not happen. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul says to the church, I am astonished, I am shocked that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now we say it again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Paul contrasts the gospel of grace, which is blessing, for all of those who would receive it with the gospel of works. And in this case, it was the idea of circumcision. You had to be circumcised before you could actually become a Christian or any other type of enemy to grace as a curse because it leads to death. And as our very own James Franco pointed out in chapter six of Galatians, Paul says that they not only perverted the gospel by expecting others to first be circumcised in order to become a Christian, they also distorted the truth to save themselves from persecution. Here's what it says in Galatians 6.12. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel, good word, you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. So here's a big point of my message. Get your pens ready. Christianity is not comfortable. And that shouldn't be that shocking to us. 
And I need to keep personally being told this because I am constantly attempting to make my life more comfortable and run away from discomfort and assume that persecution isn't worth it. Or because, and and let's be honest about this, I've made mistakes, I, like all of us, would prefer self-preservation. I would rather defend myself. I'd rather say, no, 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 I'm not that bad than God's glory. But as I read and obey the scriptures, I am taught over and over again that God not only has bought my life at a great price, but he's given me Jesus' perfect record, which means I stand justified. I stand holy before God because, as we've said many times, I'm with Jesus. It's all about him. It's all about his gospel of grace. Do not, if you are a believer in Christ, do not open this book without reading it through the lens of the redemptive work of Christ known as the gospel. Verse 6 and 7 together. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Bar-Jesus, or Elamus, which means magician, which is how he'll be addressed in the very next verse, was an attendant to the proconsul. Proconsul was a ruler of the Roman province, a ruler, or in some translations, a deputy. And he had sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God, Luke writes. But this wasn't a, hey, could you guys come here and read it to me because I want to hear it in your accent or your tone? No. He wanted to hear what the scriptures actually meant. This is something that we ought to want. We ought to want to know more of what this says, what this means. Now, on Easter this year, as we continued through the book of Acts, and we were back in Acts chapter 8 then, we read about Philip, the evangelist, and an Ethiopian treasurer. And when the Spirit led Philip to engage with the Ethiopian, Philip asked a wonderful question. And I think the Ethiopian treasurer gave an even better answer. Here's what it says in Acts 8. Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man, the treasurer, reading Isaiah the prophet. Philip then asked, do you understand what you're reading? The treasurer's reply was, how can I? Unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Our understanding of the scriptures is more important than just our frequency of reading them. That's why we get together. That's why we encourage you to be in community groups. That's why we're doing community groups the way we're doing them right now on Wednesdays and on Thursdays, because we want people to understand what the text means, not just say, hey, I read it, check a box and move on. I have known many, many people over the years that have justified themselves based on their religious effort. I can admit that I've done this. Will any of you admit this? Okay, a few of you, and liars. Now, when I worked at church, at another church, as an interim pastor, this was years ago, after the services, the the culture in that church was kind of this whole idea of like, you got done with the service, and then the pastor would kind of stand in front of the pulpit, and then a line of people would come up to talk to them to basically, um, what I noticed was to argue. (laughs) Fun, don't don't do that. My email, Mike at CO Valley, you you guys can do it that way. But this one guy, I won't mention his name, (laughs) to be honest, I don't remember it. This one guy felt like it, it was his job to tell me every place I misspoke in the sermon. That's what he was paying attention to. He's probably got like, moments in his Bible where he's like, Tim said this wrong. Salamis, that's incorrect. Anyway, and he came up to me once to let me know, this is how he began the conversation, I have read through the Bible 15 times. Now, disclaimer, I was younger, okay? I'm just going to put that out there. I wasn't the pastor of this church like I am here at COV. My goal at this church was not to help each person who got it brought and kept there to grow in their knowledge of the Son and in their understanding of grace. Here was my job at that church. It was to preach the Bible and to prepare the church for their next lead pastor. But part of that was being honest with the congregation about where they were stuck in religion rather than a relationship with Christ. 
So this man explained to me how many times he had read through the entirety of the Bible. So remember, I was younger. Here was my question back to him. Okay, so you've read through it 15 times. How often do you actually obey what you've read? Ooh. Now I know that can come off as aggressive. Or maybe because he wanted to offensively justify himself. Maybe it even sounds defensive on my part. But the reality is, and here's my point of telling you that story, you don't just grow from reading. You grow from understanding and obeying. And our emphasis is the gospel of grace. But that doesn't mean we are shallow in our teaching. It just means we filter the meaning of every text through God's redemptive plan. And so our applications here don't ever tend to be, well, I just need to try harder to be a better Christian, because that doesn't work. But we hope that generally our applications are something like, man, I want to worship God because I see how in need of grace I am and how much grace through the Son of God I am offered and have received. So understanding the text doesn't justify us, okay? Let me be clear about that. Only knowing Jesus can justify you. But understanding the text and obeying it is how we grow in knowledge and love for the actual real Jesus revealed in the scriptures. So for a second, in the story, I want you to imagine the things that Bar Jesus had been telling the proconsul named Sergius Paulus, the things that he was telling him about the scriptures, probably so off-putting that he was like, oh, I want to, I want, I have the authority, I can get Barnabas and Saul to come and tell me what this really means. Imagine the way the message of God's redemptive plan had been reversed and changed by this false prophet. Now, one thing we do as a staff periodically, and sometimes as a teaching team, is we'll look at a passage with what we know is the incorrect interpretation. And you're like, why would you do that? Because when you know it's the incorrect interpretation, you're kind of showing that you understand the, looking at the same text through the lens of the gospel. And this is probably exactly how Bar-Jesus was explaining the scriptures to Sergius Paulus, with the emphasis not on God, but perhaps on him. But what does Sergius do? He sends for Barnabas and Saul, these teachers, these men who were held in such high regard as real followers of Jesus. Verse 8, but Elamas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them <laughs> and tried to turn the pro-council from the faith. Elamus, bar Jesus, opposed them. He did not want the truth of what Paul and Barnabas were teaching to be something that influenced Sergius and others. Because Elamus had spent so much time attempting to convince people of his perverse interpretation. Bar Jesus had his identity rooted in his false interpretation of God's word and character and wanted people to exalt him rather than Jesus Christ, revealed in his word, explained and known by Barnabas and Saul. Verse 9, here's where it gets rough. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elamus. I won't look at any of you, I'll look at the camera. And said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You, will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Whoa! Wow, Paul! Take a chill pill, man! Don't have a cow, bro! Why are you being so mean? Why are you not respecting Elamus and his opinions and his preferences? Oh, because he claims to be coming in the name of the Lord, apart from what the Lord actually says in his text. Paul doesn't mince words. Elamus, you're an imposter. You're a child of the devil. This is so much worse than your mama wears combat boots. Some of you remember that this. This is savage. And he says that Elamus is an enemy of everything that is right. Paul says that the sorcerer is full of deceit and trickery, a snake oil salesman in the name of the Lord and that he perverts the right ways of the Lord to make them crooked. This is what many religions tend to do. They take away from the gospel message, they add detours and hoops to jump through, so much so that the message of the gospel gets diluted and so de-emphasized that anything that looks like a hint of the gospel of grace has been replaced with, with some working for one's salvation 
that it no longer has anything to do with the gospel, with Christianity. It's just a Christian, Christianized cult and no longer has a hint of redemption. One of the hardest things I see in the Christian faith is a shallow view of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And this is often because we don't look to the Word of God to tell us what it means to follow Jesus. Here's what we do. I'm going to be honest with you because I've done it. We just compare ourselves to other comfortable Christians. Well, I'm doing better than him. And entire letters have been written to the churches by the apostles, which point out the need to defend against a perversion of the gospel message and what it means to follow Jesus. Contending for the faith, contending for the sanctity of the gospel message is something that the early churches were being commanded to do by the apostles consistently, because without that contending, what message would we have today? Well, I'll give you the short answer. A perverse one, a message that doesn't emphasize God, but it emphasizes creation, a message that makes grace cheap and earning vital to justification, a message that is placebo and in place of actually being in a personal and experiential relationship with the triune God. This is why letters like Jude and 2 Peter were written. Let me give you some excerpts. Jude, which we studied years ago. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, same mom, different dad, you guys get that, right? Okay, good. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled, great word, to write and urge to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter writes, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over their head and their destruction has not been sleeping. One more. Paul writes to the church in Corinth in a second letter to them, and he says in chapter 11, but I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preach, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. He's pointing out that many of them would just accept that. Now, these aren't the only passages or letters in the Bible that address false teachers and being persuaded away from the truth. They are an example of the consistency among the scriptures in Jesus' brother Jude, the spokesperson of the disciples, Peter and Paul, the last to be called an apostle, all pointing out that contending for the faith is part of the believer's responsibility, not just for the pastor's. Or the elders, because everything that is not holy, honestly, is trying to pull us away from the truth of the gospel. I remember studying Jude as a church. We did it years ago. Does anyone remember Jude? It was really short. Yeah, it was fun. It, it only took, a few, I think we took like eight weeks to teach like 26 verses. That was so fun. And then a small subset of people, we jumped into Second Peter, which that letter and Jude, they go hand in hand. And there was a one person's response, which was this, why do we need to study the stu- this stuff that's so negative? <sighs> which I didn't really realize at the time, but might have been talking about them. And they either subconsciously didn't like the conviction that was coming from it, or they knew that what they were doing was wrong, and they were afraid they were going to be exposed. I have to, every time I get up here, I have to pray to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't want to teach things aside from you. And that doesn't mean I have it. One pastor friend told me once, he goes, 20% of the things I preach are wrong. I just don't know which 20%. 
And I know there are things that I've said that aren't consistent. But the one thing that I want to be more consistent in than anything else is that Jesus is Lord and we only come to God through Jesus' work, not our own. So church, this is not a 2,000-year-ago problem. This is a disease that sometimes is dormant and sometimes is a reoccurring cancer. So being serious about the truth of the gospel is what we want to do here. We do not want to be known as the deepest church. Blech. We don't want to be the coolest church. <laughs> yeah, not even close. We don't want to be the most pious church or the biggest church. All we want to do is stand before God and say, Lord, with your help, we believe we contended for the faith. And whatever we were doing, we did our best to make the gospel central. While Paul was bringing some pretty fierce accusations against this Jewish magician, then he speaks with the authority of God and he puts Elamus in his place. Here we go. Now the hand of the Lord is against you, Elamus. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of sun. Immediately, Luke writes, mist and darkness came over him and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by hand. Paul says that this would happen and it did. Luke points out that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was dominated by the Holy Spirit. One thing I want to make clear, and, and it's sad that I feel like I have to do this, but acting like this did not fill Paul with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, not Paul's aggressive nature, not Paul's frustration, not Paul's quick wit, the Holy Spirit led him to do this. And when most of us act like this, it's not because we're dominated by the Spirit of God. It's because we want to be better than someone else. But how do I know Paul was being led by the Spirit other than Luke says that he was? That Paul's threat to this Jewish mystic actually took place and he could not see, just as Paul said would happen, which brings us to the point of the entire passage. You ready? Verse 12. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. For he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. While it would be easy to assume that this narrative that Luke writes in Acts 13 is all about defending against heretics, it's not. With all that happened in Cyprus as the first missionary journey of Paul and the first missionary sent out from the church in Antioch, what does Luke document? This moment where according to many theologians, Saul became Paul. Paul embraced his apostolic calling from God. What was the point? It seems to be so much more consistent to believe that the point was what we studied last week as well, where Daniel taught, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. The proconsul who sent for Barnabas and Paul believed the word of God taught by them. He was amazed, not by Paul and Barnabas. He was not amazed by the messengers. He was amazed by the message. This coming Thursday, worship team, you can come on up. You can come up this coming Thursday. That, that's not what I meant. Come on up. This coming Thursday will mark the 486 year anniversary of the martyring of a man that many of you do not know of or have probably never heard of, but truly has been a huge blessing upon your spiritual lives, if you know it or not. William Tyndale, born near the Welsh border of England in 1494, grew up and attended the University of Oxford, eventually becoming an instructor at Cambridge. Tyndale, who was heavily influenced by Martin Luther and the Reformation, became convinced that the Bible alone should determine the practices and the doctrines of the church, that all believers should be able to read the Bible in their own language. Imagine that. Because of the influence of the printing press and a demand for scriptures in people's own languages, William Tyndale began working on the New Testament translation directly from the Greek in 1523. But his contending for the truth of the word was considered heresy by the English monarchy whose Catholic religion determined that an English version of the scriptures was illegal because the Catholic Church believed that only clergy could correctly interpret the scriptures. 
Tyndale witnessed firsthand the appalling ignorance of the Roman clergy. He was sharing a meal with one of them, and he fell into this heated argument with a Catholic clergyman, and the latter asserting this, we had better be without God's law than the Pope's. Tyndale boldly responded, no, that's not what he said. I defy the Pope and all his laws. He then added these famous words, If God spareth my life ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow shall know more of the scripture than thou dost. Which essentially means the common people will understand the scriptures better because of the word being in their own language and the Holy Spirit using them rather than a clergyman who's trying to make it all about themselves or their religion. From this point forward, the ambitious task of translating the Bible into English was Tyndale's driving mission. So he went to work in translating the first New Testament from the original Greek rather than the many copies of the scriptures that had been translated from the Latin Vulgate. Eventually, this led to a friend, oh friends, selling him out. And Tyndale was captured and imprisoned for a year and a half while a case was brought against him. In that time, in true Pauline fashion, he led guards and others who were in charge of his imprisonment to Christ. Tyndale was executed on October 6th, 1536. He was strangled, burned, and his body blown apart by gunpowder. But when finally asked to recount and renounce his heresy, he shared his famous last words, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. There is no doubt that by this monumental work, Tyndale changed the course of English history and Western civilization. William Tyndale contended for the faith, believed by his willingness to fight for the right, for the truth to be shared and studied and believed. And while most of, if not all of us, will never physically be martyred for contending for the faith, that doesn't mean that our lives won't be full of hurt and suffering will be misunderstood by people inside and outside of the church. People will think that we're too fanatical or closed-minded. Accusations will be thrown at those who contend for the faith, for the truth, for the gospel. But I want to tell you, Jesus is worth it. Even if you suffer for a while, the truth of the gospel being preserved and shared and presented will always be worth the heartache because Jesus is worth everything. So let me conclude with Jesus' words when the disciples were talking to him about what it means to follow him. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to be my disciplined pupil, whoever wants to follow me must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Let's pray.